Hello everyone, welcome to Toxic Google. My name is Kevin Belk, and today we have a Toxic Google on Rock the Casbah. So let's welcome Mr. Bill Murray and Mitch Glazer. Like the Kesba. Uh wonderful film. You play uh, Richie Lands. You wrote and produced the film. Yep. And so, can you talk about just the story? Um, the basic story is Bill's character, Richie Lands, is kind of a third rate, never was on his ba down on his luck um, rock manager. I was going to say sleazy rock manager, but it's kind of self explanatory. Redundant. Uh, yeah, redundant. And um, who uh, takes his last act, who is his secretary, played by Zoe Deschanel, uh, to, co to Kabul and to Afghanistan to do USO tour, which is his way back into the big time. And uh, she freaks out because, you know, this is, uh, takes place five or six years ago uh, and, and still, you know, a terrifying place for, you know, for all the reasons. She freaks out, steals his money, his passport, his wallet, leaves him stranded in Afghanistan. And the rest of it, kind of, the, the, the journey plays out from there. But what basically, what happens in the, in the movie is that he uses his rock manager skills, um, again, redundant, I guess, uh, to, he hears a wonderful singer in, in, uh, in southern Afghanistan, a girl singing in a cave, and realizes that this is a voice he's never heard before, and, and manages, manages her into the Afghan star competition, which is based on, it's, it's their American Idol, and it does exist. And... Um, and, and Richie Lands does that, and that's basically the engine of the movie, I would say, right? You were there. <laughs> it's okay. Can you hear us if we don't use these microphones? Not the same, huh? We need them. Yeah, that's, that's enough. I mean, you want to leave some mystery for the people that are going to pay. So your character, Richie Lands, you've talked about how he has been uh, influenced by just a lot of uh, agents and managers that you've kind of met over in your life and Bill Graham I think was one of them too and Bill Graham certainly was one hilarious episode of a, a rock and roll manager promoter someone that I got to witness on a couple of occasions and uh, another cat we know in New York named Ron Delsner who's just nuts just really nuts. probably suing us as we speak <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, he's nice it's he, he you know they're both very he, Delsner is really funny Constantly self-deprecating while uh, cutting people's heads off. It's lots of fun. But um, <clears throat> how are you all doing this afternoon? There we go. They're in love with you guys. So you guys have known each other for years, too. So you guys knew each other back from the SNL days. We have, yeah. I was introduced to Bill, uh, our mutual friend, John Belushi, was a friend. I'd done a piece on him in 77. And John and I became friends, and I, I was sitting in uh, Studio 8H in uh, New York, Saturday Night Live, and John waves somebody over from behind me, and this guy comes over, and he goes, Mitch, this is Billy, the new kid. And um, so we met in 77, but we became close, you know, as collaborators on Scrooge in 87, which, which I wrote with my late writing partner, Michael O'Donohue, <laughs> and Billy was in. Um, but we worked together a lot, and, and over the remaining 30 years. Yeah, because you guys had Scrooge and Passion Play, which was your first film right. you directed, Bill in. Bill was in, and then, um, uh, what you call it, Charlie's Angels, and you know, I was a writer on for nine weeks, and uh, the first Charlie's Angels. Um, the real one. The real one. Yeah. <laughs> the classic. How, how do you direct Bill? Uh, it, it, it was a dream. I mean, you know, he was, fortunately we knew each other, the bigger question was, how did I direct Mickey Rourke? But that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother visit. Um, no, he's, you know, Bill's, Bill's it's weird from him sitting here, but he's the best, uh, you know, to, to collaborate with. Um, he's a great friend, but he brings a lot of energy and, 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 um, and all those years of, of talent to, to what he does. And he's easy, he's great to direct. I mean, he loves to collaborate. It was, it was a dream. And you guys have another special coming up with Netflix, A, a Very Merry Christmas, uh, that's writing with Sofia Coppola. I exactly. As well. Yeah. And so, uh, what keeps bringing you guys just together? So like, what is that collaboration? What is it like just to continue to work with your friend? Well, 
Hollywood is a tricky uh, place, and uh, when you have a, if you last long enough, you have some, you have a, a career involves really nightmarish episodes. You have some really bad episodes. If you don't have them, you didn't really have a career, and you weren't really there. So you can have a career that, you know, I was very lucky. I had a lot of success early on. And then along the way, you, 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 you meet some real monsters. You meet some people who are, just have incredible positions of authority without any of the qualifications for them. Do you know the kind of people I'm talking about? <clears throat> you meet people like that that are just incapable of getting out of their own way and are fearful of sharing a responsibility. They're just not able to... Uh, work with, they don't play well with others, you know, they just don't, and so they, having those experiences where you work with someone and you do your best every day and you make everything better every day and they still don't understand that, you know, that you should be, you know, that I'm here to help, I'm not here, it's not about me, I'm really here to help, but I go on a little too much about it because I've had, uh, it's like a, it's like a five o'clock in the afternoon coffee, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, so we had uh, some of these monstrous things happen. Like the Scrooge was, we had a character who was the director who was it was jaw dropping. I could, I mean, if you had a few hours and like half of a, a bar, we could get to the, some of these stories. But just dealing with this guy and making a, a movie about Christmas, and and really the Dickens story of Scrooge and how you could miss that one, how you could, how you had to be reeducated on that one every four hours was it was. Mind-boggling. So that was really, that was a, a very important moment where I realized, you know, if you have to go to war with someone, you better go with someone who's been in before, you know, who's been through something horrible, and you, then you don't have that. There's no fear, and you realize, well, if you just keep playing your game, you know. And my feeling always is when we work together, when we write together, that if it makes us laugh or moves us, then I'm cool. Then I then I go in armored and and I, I you know. I can't be challenged because um, that's the first initial hurdle or the the person you want to please is your writing partner. We've written a script together and, and um, you know, we laugh at the same things. It's it, it's It's been wonderful. What makes a Bill Murray movie a Bill Murray movie? So what are those elements that you put in there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm right here, right next to him. Maybe, maybe you could answer what makes a Bill Murray movie. Mr. Bill well, Murray, what makes a movie? <clears throat> Number one, Perhaps services? get get Bill Murray in it. <laughs> um, right, we can move on. I think it. that's it. <laughs> no, it's just, I don't know. I get it, it. Partly that. I guess a lot of it is being in it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I just do the ones I like. I don't have any agenda. I don't have any kind of move that I want to go a certain way. Particularly, I've just had this funny career where I started out doing comedies and then I ended up uh, doing more serious roles. And I wasn't intending to do it that way. And now this movie's funny again. Now there was, we do have a mutual friend who said, <laughs> when I was lying on my back <laughs> on the, in Venice at the end of some thing, he said, Bill, you know, you do these sad movies and you end up taking them home with you, you know? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> And, you know, your life isn't always fun anyway. Maybe you should think about doing something funny. <laughs> and it's a funny, it, when you're lying on your back on marble, you know, it just changes everything because you're, <clears throat> you're a little bit more uh, receptive. But this just happened to come up, up not hard upon that, but soon after there was a movie where there was a chance to be funny. And I thought, well, if you, I, I do believe that if you can write, you must write. And I do believe if you can be funny, you should be funny. People need funny. They need funny. Moving on from that terrible question I just asked. No, that's, that's uh, okay. But, uh, I, no. I, I tried to help. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Murray, help me. All right. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about this movie was like, Richie Lands tries to bring a lot of American culture. Have you seen this movie? Yeah, we just saw it last night. You all saw it? Uh, a lot of us saw it, yeah. How many people Woo! saw it? Yes. Good. All right, we still got some major box office to corral in this room. <laughs> Okay, so you saw it. Anyway, I'll go ahead. Okay, yeah. go ahead. But he tries to bring a lot of American culture into Afghanistan. You guys filmed in Morocco, so, what, so it wasn't quite Afghanistan, but what did you see in that culture that maybe we should be bringing back here to the Western world? It was amazing, actually, because we filmed it during Ramadan, uh, July of 2014, June, July of 2014, 
Um, and there were there were options. I was telling Billy earlier. You know, producers were saying you should do it in New Mexico. And but from the beginning, the movie had to have the feel of a Muslim world. I mean, it just did. And, and um, so we were really, in, 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 you know, serious about that. Um, so half our crew was uh, was a Muslim crew and and experiencing Ramadan with them. And you know, Bill kind of insists that you you take a huge bite out of life wherever you are. But um, there you are in Marrakesh and in Morocco. So we, you know, he had two of his sons with him, and and uh, on weekends my wife and I would join them and went to Fez and Rabat and Eswera, and we really got to. They went up to the Atlas Mountains. We really did. I mean, we left after seven weeks, and Bill stayed, you know, because because it was so so powerful. But there are moments there that are um, that'll be with me forever. Just just you know, the beauty of of, uh, of the city, the culture. And, uh, and getting a chance to, to work in a place like that was, was a dream. And we also did shoot, we, there's a, a woman named Galara who um, works for Vice, who shot all the Kabul, Kabul footage in the movie. So anytime you don't see an actor, but it's all the, the footage of people watching the TVs and, and the, you know, all that was from Afghanistan. Um, and beautifully shot and seamless, really. Um, I thought it, was a, it really was a magical two months for, for all of us. And, and the, mo the movie at the end of the day is about what's universal. I mean, it really, you know, not what separates us, but a father loves his daughter. Um, every, everybody loves music and loves to laugh. And, and, uh, and who better to take us through that? It was a, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Morocco. It's a beautiful place. I strongly recommend it as a place to visit and see. And I made a joke the other day. It's like, it's, it's entry level Africa. You know, you get, you get in, and, and it's sort of the easiest way into sort of go like, hey, it's a whole different world here, and it's sort of an entry level Muslim world too, because it's it's a predominantly Muslim country, and it's a, you know, what we might call like a softer, gentle, gen, gentler, less strident uh, Muslim country, and sort of like Indonesia is easier, and it's not, you know, you have some sort of anticipation or fear or anxiety about some sort of reactionary Muslim and. These are people that sort of read the book the way it, re it reads. You know, they don't they don't reinterpret it in a, in a bizarre, f in an unusual fashion. They it's pretty straightforward. And so when we come there with American culture, that's your question. We come there with our American movie making and the way we treat people. Well, the Ramadan thing was a very big thing. You know what Ramadan is? The people don't eat or drink through the in the daylight hours. And because this was a late Ramadan in July. These were the longest day, long, longer days of the year, so it was a bad time to be having, and the hottest. So there's just a struggle. Everyone's struggling through it, and you know, even if you're not a Muslim, you 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 feel the struggle all around you, and that uh, you know, if that sort of relationship that you get with someone, where this is how I treat you, <clears throat> this is how we talk, this is how we walk back and forth to the job, this is how we carry something together. This is how we move around in a circle. This is how we walk back and forth to lunch. All that sort of just, you know, it's sort of, there's a germ that lands in you. It, it, it was probably given to us much earlier in our life, but that connection <clears throat> grows through the time. So when the time comes when the days get hard and the, the days are long and movie days are long, they're insufferably long, and there's no point in the, in the locals to quit before they can eat anyway. So they just want to keep going because if we stay working on the job until dark, then we get to eat for, on the movie, sort of, you know what I mean? And then, then it's like, then we all sort of break bread and we stop. And that was good. People didn't have to drive all the way to their homes. The movie provided a meal. When the sun went down, we stopped and we ate. And even if we had to keep going, we stopped and we ate. And everyone stopped and ate and all the different departments went, oh, we don't work now. We stop and we eat as, as a group. And you feel it in, on screen. I mean, you feel, you feel, you know, as Bill says, you know, the, the, that the exotic and, and the unusual and the, the magical of it on screen. You know, it really, it really does. I noticed it last night. We watched the screen, or two nights ago, whenever we saw the movie again. And the credits roll, and you're used to seeing, you know, kind of like show business names, like, hey, there's Wally Westmore, you know, you know, some guy that you know. And they're all Muslim names. I don't know anyone. You know, it's like, well, I, but he was, everyone had a nickname, so it's like, I don't know who like Saruf Kaim Daul is, you know? But everyone had nicknames, and you'd have to go like, ah, you know, you'd point, because the names, you never knew anyone's entire name, which could be three or four words, and, 
And it, but to the fact that here's this American movie that has an entire crew that's not, that's, that's not American, it was, um, you know, you, you feel good about that. You guys brought Rock the Casbah to Comic-Con this year, which had to be insane. So what was that experience like? Because it was both your first, right? Yeah, it was amazing. And, and I got to say, uh, neither of us had done it, but it was in that big room in the 6,500 seat or 7,000 seat or whatever it is. Yeah. And, uh, and his entrance was too smoke on the water through the back of the room. Something I'd seen Mick Jagger do to a different song, clearly. But uh, it was it was epic. I mean, it was really exciting. And then Bill, Bill insisted on leaving the same way, which was <laughs> insanely bold. Well, I was charmed by it. I, I, I had a kind of a, you know, just a healthy, maybe, you know, cautious attitude about people that dressed as Wonder Woman, you know, <laughs> especially if they weren't a woman. I felt funny about them. <clears throat> so, woo! <clears throat> This is actually a perfect time, actually, so we have to acknowledge this. You're from Chicago, I'm from Chicago. Cubbies are playing right now. Game four of the playoffs. So we're going to get a score check right now and also some Cubs gear. <clears throat> is there anyone out there that's a Cub fan that doesn't have a Cub hat? I have one. I have one, so I'm going to let you have mine. There you go. I'll hand it to her. <laughs> a great point actually so the internet is this, is this beer that is beer i'm not really a beer guy i'm more of a hard liquor guy are you a beer girl beer. right here <laughs> she looks very thirsty can you share with her all right all right that's good all right. Popcorn? i have popcorn too <laughs> <laughs> okay all right, just put your hand out. <laughs> put both hands out. <laughs> what do you want? Both hands. That's there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and then put your gum in there. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. But, so you're from Chicago. How did... Uh, growing up in Chicago shape you as a person today? Well, <clears throat> it gets very cold in Chicago in the winter. And people from out of town go, then go, it gets, it, they just can't believe that it gets that cold. But people from cold weather places like Minneapolis or Green Bay or Chicago, you end up trying to figure out how to entertain yourself in the cold. And <clears throat> we were talking yesterday about <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a son that has a, has a can, that has a job. <laughs> well, I have two that have jobs. <laughs> but um, he said, "You taught me how to work." And I said, "I," and you know, I thought, "Well, that's uh, how? How did that happen?" He said, "It was that night we had to, we were at Peggy's house, my sister Peggy's house, and she has a driveway that's very long, very very long, like maybe 60, 70 yards long." And, and she said, and he said, you, and you made us shovel the snow. Well, it doesn't sound like a big thing, but when you have to shovel like 4,200 square yards of, of driveway in like a 12-inch snowstorm, you've got to go out there several times. You can't wait till it, for it to stop or you'll never be able to do it. You have to go out when there's four inches on the ground, and then you have to go out again when there's the next four inches on the ground, and then you have to go out... So it's about a six-hour job to do it. Otherwise, you'll never get it done. So he, I just wouldn't let him quit until we got it all the way done each time. And he just couldn't believe that I was just still going to be out there. He's like, come on, old man, give up. You know, it's like, <laughs> this is what we do here. This is how we live in Chicago. You have to get it done. And then it gets hot in the summer. And people are friendly there. You know, they're just kind of natural and friendly, pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of mystery to it. People root for the Cubs or the Sox or the Bears or something. And I don't know, I come from a very big family, so that was a great part of the education because you have to get along with, you know, I mean, you got to get along with people at work. I, you got to get along with people at home. You know, that's, <laughs> it's even harder sometimes. And then, um, and I was a caddy. And so I worked my way through school as a caddy. And 
that's really when you have a, a great, that's a great opportunity to, to acquire an education because you see how you learn how to treat people. You, you learn how you would like to be treated. Like you are really a slave, you're really a servant. The dis job description is show up, keep up, and shut up. And that's where it begins. And you're, you have to be able to last four or five hours in that mode without ever imposing your personality on the event. And that you see people who recognize the struggle that that is and not only urge you to show yourself, but they respect the effort you're giving and they treat you with kindness. So, you know, it's like I can always tell someone that's like a real prick to a waiter. I just think, you, you know, you should have caddied. You really should have caddied. You, you, learn, you, know, you know, it's like. <clears throat> But, you know, it's not like it's, and it was, I was, it was luck. It was, very, it was just luck, and it was just my fortune that I had to work that I got, I got it. So we're going to take some questions from our audience in a few minutes, but we're going to bring up Dana Hanklein, who runs our social media for Talks Google, and uh, she has some questions that she's gathered from Twitter and from our internal folks as well. Hi, guys. How's it going? <laughs> Uh, Mitch, this one is for you. Um, so your characters speak Pashto and Dari, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering those languages, um, without subtitles. So they're wondering what um, what was your sort of train of thought in not subtitling it? Was it to kind of make us a little uncomfortable? Um, and, and then also, what um, what were the choices to have Salima sing only American songs? Okay, the the, the, the Pashto and, 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 and other languages that, that, that are used, um, their choice is not to use subtitles because we had a character, uh, a great actor named Aryan, who played this cab driver, Riza, who's with, with Bill throughout this journey. And there's some, because he was such a wonderful actor, I mean, there's a scene around a campfire where he translates what the Pasht Pashtun leader is saying. And it, I just thought, and, and Barry Levinson agreed, that it was more powerful and more beautiful to, to hear him repeat the words, hear them both say them, and then there's yeah there is that lag of what's what's he saying, and so it really was a, almost a cinematic device more than than accuracy. It was just something that I thought would be more, we thought would be more powerful, um, and as far as as far as the Cat Stevens, that was really for three reasons. One, I, you know, I grew up in the '70s, loved Cat Stevens from day one, uh, so his music is powerful, and Peace Train was always ending for seven years from the very first uh, you know iteration of the script. It was it was ending the movie, um, but the idea that a Pashtun girl would feel better about singing a Muslim singer's songs, even a Western singer, um, felt important. I mean, it felt logical and important that that she wouldn't be doing, you know, Nicki Minaj in the in the in the cat. That it would be that it would be, you know, as, she, as Bill's character says in the movie, she does the Muslim West. I mean, she she feels comfortable singing that. Wonderful. Uh, Bill, this one's for you. You've played several iconic film roles. Are there any roles that you passed on where later you thought, I wish I'd taken that or I would have taken that character in a different direction? <clears throat> Were there none that I passed on uh, that uh, I really coveted, you know? Uh, there was one, I w for a moment I was told I was going to be in the movie Philadelphia. And uh, I've... I didn't bring myself to see it until about an hour ago, you know, <laughs> but but I like the film and they did a good job with the movie, and uh, and Tom Hanks was really great. I don't know what part. I think I was going to play the other part, Denzel Washington's part, but it was. I think it was more important. <laughs> huh? <laughs> What's the damn funny, bitch? <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't really mean that, <laughs> but um. But no, I, I, but I think, I think the director, Jonathan Demme, thought it was more important that the way the character was written, it's sort of like Denzel, the, it's like a black man on the down, down low, was the way that it sort of came across in the film, if you remember the film. And he thought that that was a more important thing to speak to, I think, or a very important thing to do, and more important than having me in the film, yeah. So our last question is, uh, if you were a real rock tour manager, what two bands would you want to manage for both of you? Well, I wanted to say about Comic Con. Sorry. <laughs> well, splice. I wanted to say about Comic Con that uh, I I was charmed by that that group. They were so sweet, and I had the occasion of seeing the last Grateful Dead show in Chicago the week before, and it's just it was just delirium. 
And there was just this joyous, like imagine that all of these people in this room were dancing complete, in a completely uninhibited fashion. Can you imagine what that's like? And that's what it's like at a dead show. And I hadn't seen one in a long time, but it was 150,000 people maybe dancing completely uninhibitedly and just happy and free and relaxed. And the Comic-Con crowd was that way too. They were dressed as Batgirl or whatever, Batman. And, and they were laughing together and they were amusing each other and they were delighted in each other and they were in love. They really were in love. I was really charmed by that. So I just want to make that... Um, <laughs> express that. But you asked a question about uh, what bands. What bands would I like to hear? Would you manage? manage? Would I manage? Well, there was a great band back in the day called the Amazing Rhythm Aces. And they only had one hit song. It was called Third Rate Romance, Low Rent Rendezvous, which is kind of a clever song. But the way they could play live was extraordinary. And they were great songwriters, really great songwriters. And the lead fellow, Russell Smith, still writes great songs for all the country guys. He's a Nashville guy now. They live down there. And you can still hire the Amazing races to, aces, the amazing Rhythm Aces to come to your house and play. But um, they, I, I never felt like they had the right people pushing them along, that they were something that they had that was unique, that there was a soul that they had that really came across in their live performance and in their recordings that never was... Uh, it didn't get fostered properly. It didn't get uh, shown around, and their records are really beautiful, and they're you know they're they're among my treasures. Now, a second band. <clears throat> well, I like this fellow, Big Head Todd. Do you know Big Head Todd and the Monsters? He's a really wonderful player, and uh, I used to hit golf balls to his music. I used to take <laughs> take a boombox to the driving range and hit golf balls <laughs> to that uh, you know. Uh, Bittersweet, you know, those songs that they sing. But he, someone that, on, on his own, he, he's from Colorado, he left and moved to Chicago to learn better how to play the blues, and he became great friends of Hubert Sumlin, whom we know is one of the great elders, and stayed with Hubert Sumlin, Sum, Sumlin and just played with him for, I don't know, a couple of years, and was asked by his family to pl to play Hubert into the ground when they lowered his casket into the ground. And he's a beautiful man who came to my party a couple of years ago, had a lot to drink, uh, got sick uh, on my son's uh, cowboy boot, but <laughs> <clears throat> fell asleep for a little while, and then woke up around five in the morning and played songs for two and a half hours straight. <laughs> so that's, he's got a great spirit, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, it would be mostly friends. I, my, my friend Steve Jordan has a band called The Verbs with his wife, Megan Voss. Love to manage him. He just produced Keith Richards' new new album with Keith and and uh, world's greatest drummer, and and we love Jenny Lewis. I mean, I would I would I'd love to manage her for the for the laughs. Audience question. Hey, Bill. Um, my grandfather's birthday is coming up. He's turning ninety one, and it's really hard to get him to laugh. And um, I'm not very funny, but you are. So I was wondering if you could help me out with a joke. <laughs> For his birthday? Okay, I'm not, I, I usually forget jokes pretty quickly, but I've got this one. I still have it. My brother Brian is really good with the jokes, and this is, I'm actually, a, I've been appointed to an official Vatican uh, position. I am, I'm a, a, the official Vatican uh, co consulate, or whatever the hell I am, <laughs> to the Pope on, on humor. <clears throat> it's true. It's true. <laughs> And so uh, it turns out the Pope wants me to play him when the movie's made, and uh, maybe we'll see. That, make, that could be that his one. agent. That could be his agent. <clears throat> but he had a program when he came to the USA, tell a joke to the Pope. And so what they did was they asked people to like film themselves telling a joke to the Pope. And I'll tell you the joke I told to the Pope. And let's see. <clears throat> So these two uh, antenna got married. Uh, that's the big news in my town. These two antenna got married last week. And uh, the ceremony was, you know, it was, it was okay. It was nice. It was fine. But the reception was extraordinary. <laughs> It's 
See, and that's, that's PG-13. I mean, you can tell that. You're, you can play with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bill, a lot of the work you've done in your life, both in comedy and drama, has dealt with artificial barriers, human isolation, and loneliness. So maybe you have some insight. What's one of the most common and ridiculously sad ways that we make it harder to connect with each other? Well, sometimes you get asked a question and the right <laughs> answer, the right answer isn't right in front of you and you just sort of try to, because it's a feeling, it's a feeling that you're, you're looking for. So I have to try to feel and, re and recall the most recent feeling of this. <clears throat> so I think, I think that th there's many ways to portray it or to show it, but there's this feeling that we're alone. And we're not alone. We're not alone. And it's you can d fool yourself that it's just you that feels pain. You can hypnotize yourself or delude yourself that no one could ever understand how I feel. No one could ever, no one's ever felt this fucking miserable as I feel right now. And it's wrong. Because you felt that miserable. And you felt that miserable. And life is hard enough that the idea of elevating ourselves and making ourselves better, perfecting ourselves, or becoming more of our true self is so daunting and so impossible that we have to, we have to grab and realize that we cannot do it alone. And there's a, there's a connection that you have to me, certainly by asking the question, and to all of us, by asking the question, because you're asking all of us this question. And all of us have this question ourselves, whether it's in the front of our head as you were speaking, or if it is now. We all have this question. And to let that question settle down in you is really the bravery, is the courage. It's the try. It's the try. You know, you can, you got to try. You know, it's not, it's easy to distract yourself or to be distracted or to turn on a television or to drink uh, a beer or to or read a cartoons or a stupid anything or to just, you know, walk up and down stairs. But to try to come back and say, observe and say, this is who I am right now. And it's okay that I'm this person now. And it's okay that I keep coming back to this now because I'm trying to not feel that way as a rule. I'm trying to overcome the weakness of letting the emotions take me down. And by seeing it in the, at, the, at the moment, something changes, like something lands in you that's different and you're able to feel the grace, it's really grace, that can push you to try. And it's like, there's no harm in trying, right? It's not going to make you, it's not going to break you maybe, but there can be no harm in trying. And if you try, you feel better about yourself. Thank you. This question is for Bill. You, you told us earlier how you worked with a lot of monsters over the time. And it seems as the first decade of the 2000s, or the aughts, as they're sometimes known, you did a lot of independent films, which I quite enjoyed, the ones you did with Jim Jarmusch, with, so the Lost in Translation with Sofia um, Coppola. Was that kind of a, what you turned into, doing more independent films versus the, the blockbusters? Or is that just no, I, I turned into this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, I, I didn't really turn to it. It wasn't a reaction to anything. I don't like I I didn't really have any kind of a plan. I just I just do the ones I like to do. I'm not very organized. I just do the ones I like to do. Like I said, I'd do this movie seven years ago, and it wasn't like oh that was seven years ago, man. No, I said I'd do it. I mean that's I like it. I, that that doesn't change. I didn't have any real any plan. 
they just came this way. And I had a certain kind of luck in that I feel if you do this job and you don't completely embarrass yourself, that you remain legitimate, you, you, re, you remain viable. I've, I've done casting myself where you look through the book and you go like, oh, here's so-and-so. Oh, my God, he did that horrible, what's him call that movie? Remember that piece of crap he did? You know, and you go, and you lose that guy because anyone that would sign on to a death ship like that that's bad, you can't, you know, you just don't trust him anymore. I've been lucky about choosing. Like, I haven't, you know, I haven't done anything, you know, for which I could be prosecuted, you know, I couldn't, you know, and that you just stay viable. And then the sort of this next generation of people like Wes Anderson and Sophia, they go, well, yeah, that guy's okay. He's not terrible yet. And then you get, you get to work more. And it's, it's the same in every kind of career, I think. You know, it's like a carpenter makes a great piece of work. He doesn't rip people off. He's like, hey, this guy made my garage. You know, he's good. You know, you, you last. Your, your mark, your reputation lives. You know, you don't kill it. Thank you. So we have two books here that you have brought with you. Um, Reporting Always by Lillian Ross. Yes. Okay, this is, it's called Reporting Always. She was what they called a reporter back when she started writing. Um, then she became a journalist because they changed the, the job title. Her name is Lillian Ross, and she's most famous for writing for The New Yorker for decades. And she did profiles of um, Mitch, you can help me here. She did profiles of some of the f most yeah. famous people Hemingway. Of, of the century. Hemingway and Houston. Chaplin and John Huston. And they're spectacular to read. Her one of Hemingway was, was groundbreaking because Hemingway was this mythic character, this gigantic character. And she, she gave him a human voice that was beautiful to read and engaging. You felt like you knew the man by reading her words. Um, she's... She wrote for The New Yorker for uh, maybe 40 years or something like that. And she had a romance with the man who was the editor, a secret romance with the man who was the editor that wasn't that much of a secret, but it was kind of a secret romance. And then when that editor was fired, she quit re working for the, paper, for the magazine. And then a new editor came later, and she went back to writing for them. She's 90 now. And I've read a bunch of her stuff. And she's, I've been friendly with her, and I, get, I like to tease her. She's like a little thing, got curly hair, and you can just mess with her. She's a lot of fun. And she's real, she's real smart and real funny, so you can mess with her all you like, and she'll take it. And then any moment, she just gives you a look like, I could bite your head off, you know that. <laughs> and she's fun. She's really a lot of fun to be with. So her friend asked me to do some sort of thing, I don't know, something modern to help her sell her book. And I didn't know the answer to it. And someone said, well, if you bring it along, maybe some people will notice it. There's a little, there's a little um, caricature of her. She's a sweetie. But there's a... So I started looking at this book. There's a, a profile of the... Do you know what the Junior League is? You know, the, 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 the Women's Junior League? She, does, she did a profile here in 1954 of the Women's Junior League that I think might be one of the funniest things I've ever read in my entire life. And it's all facts. It's just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. She just writes the facts down, and you are, I, I mean, I was shaking, I was shaking reading this thing. Anyway, if, if, you're in, if you're interested in journalism, or you're interested in writing, or you're interested in knowing what it's like to have real ears, to have a, a higher developed sense of listening, of hearing, you know, we're in this sort of state you know, and what have we got if you, if you, when you wake in waking state? You know, you wake up and you've got your eyes and you've got your ears and your taste and your, you know, you, you've got these, these, these functions, that these, these, uh, these aspects that you can work with. Her ears are like, unlike anything I've ever seen. And the way she hears and the way that her ears um, almost separate that which is essential from that which is not. And she's able to recall it and put it down. It's an amazing piece of, of literature. To, and, it's, and yet it's not literature. It's writing. It's writing. It's just facts. And it's extraordinary. It's called Reporting Always. Her name is Lillian Ross. And if you, um, I, I, I was told that I, the, the idea would be to bring books out. And we I have some for the audience. You got some yeah. books. We so had some. So after the I show. Don't know, I don't know how many books there are, but. This is um, 
This is some dame. She's really something, this one. She's a real pistol. And, uh, and kind. And then you got that one. And this is a... And then I mentioned that I was going to say something about that. And my friend... I said to my friend who had a funny look on his face. You know, we're talking about that thing about helping someone carry something off of a truck or something. And we have a friend who, who is cursed with great wealth, you know. And it's... And all he does is pick up the checks of the world. That's all he does. And it's amazing. You see on his face that he feels this sense of obligation that because he's been blessed with this, that he has to sort of even it up all the way across the world. Everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes, in the quietest, most uh, subtle way, he just passes the money back. He just tries to pass it all back. And I said, gee, I wonder if there's something you'd like me to talk about. And he said, his friend has a cookbook. <laughs> his friend has a cookbook, right? <laughs> this is the guy. It's not like, hey, uh, you know, get me a date with a supermodel. No, he's like, um, my friend has a cookbook. That's the way he thinks. And this book is called Crossroads. And our friend has this restaurant in California, in Los Angeles, called Crossroads. It's a vegan restaurant with a really good bar, <laughs> which is... I'm a, the vegans blow my mind. Yeah, they really do. They really do. It's like they're stoners and they're drunks and they're vegans. They're just, I don't know how they do. I don't, and I'm going, like, okay, I'm down with that. It's like, you're a, Morgan and, a Mormon and you believe, but you've got nine wives. Okay, it's cool. I'm all right. It's just, it's just an interpretation. And anyway, this fellow's name is Tal Ronan. And he wrote this book, Crossroads. I've eaten this guy's food and it is... It's ridiculous. It's dazzling because he, 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 he's a you know, a trained chef and he has vegan food that doubles as, tastes like, you know, he'll have, uh, you know, bolognese sauce or lasagna or whatever. And it, it really is an amazing magic act. And the food's wonderful. It really is magic. Yeah. It really is. Because it tastes like something that you think it is and it's not. It really is extraordinary. So if, if you eat food or know people that do... <laughs> This would be a great one to give them because it's, it may be the future that we have to eat healthy. You never know. <laughs> and we have some copies for you guys, too. Oh, we have um, books of those, too? Yeah. Cool. Hey, um, just for showing up. All you foodies. So I kind of want to end with this. One of my favorite scenes is actually not in the movie. It was actually the tag. And I think that was just absolutely hilarious. So was there any of your favorite scenes or a scene that may have gotten cut just for time or just didn't fit in the story? Well, the, the, the tag you're referring to is, is, was the very last scene we shot on the very last day in, uh, in Morocco. And there was just a spectacular-looking older man there. And, 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 and earlier, Bill was talking about Buster Keaton earlier in the day. And there is, a, there is an, a, an incredible invented scene between Bill and this, this you know, 75-year-old Moroccan man that, you know, at, a, at a store kind of discussing or, or arguing over you know, string and, and a, an elephant and how much it's going to cost. And anyhow, it's on the tag as credits go. So st stick around and watch it because it's beautiful. My favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, is a scene that Bill does um, in one. I mean, it's a it's shot through a window of a of a truck. Bill gets out of the truck, goes out, thinks about something, turns around and comes back to the car and, and delivers a scene. There are no cuts in it. He did it twice, and uh, I was sitting with Barry Levinson. Both of us really mouths open. It's just a beautiful piece of acting, an insane ride, <laughs> really well written, and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's my favorite scene in in the movie. Yeah. How about you? Well, no, they're all perfect. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I'm trying to think of something. I'm trying to think of something that just made a strong impression on me, watching-wise. This little man that I do the scene with the string with is really something. He wasn't even an actor. He was just a guy, and with an amazing face. And I basically hungle and try to like, you know, like bite him down on the price of string. You know, it's like not, not a very nice scene, but very uh, fun. Um, there were, I, I think the really scene that I miss, uh, that I love the most about was just being in Morocco, was seeing the way, I've never seen people drive like this. There's multiple kinds of vehicles. It, it, there's 
there's still animals. There's still animals pulling wagons. There's big trucks. There's like semi-tractor trailers. There's a lot of these crazy uh, three-wheeled motorcycles with huge carrying racks on the back. Every one of them was different. Uh, there were motorcycles that were that had like a like a bed in the back of it. That so, we saw one that had hay that was maybe 16 feet high. But the combinations of junk that they put into these motorcycles and drove, and then there were people on bicycles and all kinds of different vehicles. And I never saw people drive and miss each other like this. They just moved off. They were like fish. You know, you don't see fish crash into each other, right? You don't see a school of fish, oh, sorry. You don't, you know, they just kind of go, hey, hey, hey. Like the Blue Angels, but there's thousands of them. And that's what Morocco was like. And you'd see, you know, if you've ever been to Asia or someplace where you see an entire family on a motor scooter. There'll be five people on a motor scooter. And the woman, always dressed in beautiful color, riding sad saddle on the back. And I think, this is crazy. You know, there's like, there's a kid in front of the dad, there's two kids in between, and then there's the mom, and she's holding a kid, and she's on the back, and she's riding side saddle. And they don't fall, and they don't crash, and they just move like this. They just move. They're really um, beautiful people. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> so go see, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. I asked it outside, and I, maybe one of you guys, which one of you guys is the brains of Google? Can I? <laughs> oh, there you are. So, um, so I've got a question. Why does Google ask me for my secret password, and I, keeps, and I say no, but it keeps asking me. Isn't it smart enough to like, get the hint? I'm not going <laughs> to give it out. Why, do they, why does it keep asking? It, shouldn't it know that I'm not going to do that because I'm just shy? First, safety. No, I I agree with you. I believe it does about the safety, but I, I just try to. I always feel like a guy asked me a question today. What is what is your secret to life? And I said, if I told you my secret, then it's not a secret anymore, is it? And would you ever want to be involved with someone that couldn't keep a secret? Would you like to be friends with someone that couldn't keep a secret? I guess I'm just going over the same old territory again, but that's that's sort of how I feel. It's nice to come here and, and put a face with the bicycle. Thanks very much. <laughs>